Okay, well, we're back here with Michael Brand. We're going to be expanding more upon the offering and what brand offering is, what it does, and just some subtle nuances as to how how it came to be and how it affects people's lives, primarily the creator, the person who created it, who I have with me again here today, Michael Brand. So uh, welcome back, Michael. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, nice talking to you again, too. I look look forward to this. Now, I wanted to just kind of follow, you know, basically just kind of follow up where we left off last time uh, with a few things in between. Our last podcast, uh, roughly like an hour and a half long, I felt was really, really poignant, really good. I think people really liked it. There's some very interesting points in there. We dive deeply into the structure of words, letters, symbols. But since then, you have posted a few different different readings yourself. And the one that I kind of wanted to just, you know, jump into is the one on purpose. So, I mean, there's so many places we can go with this, but you well, one of the things you talk about in there a lot is the the difference in someone's life uh, finding their purpose or creating their purpose or just discovering their purpose you talk a lot about the that individual pursuit how that affects a person individually but then you also talk about how that pursuit affects the collective and i kind of feel like this is a really good topic right now because well i'll say it like this for me when i hear the word the collective i tend to think of it in a negative way it's not a negative it's not a negative word but just for me when i when i hear that word i think of the hive mind i think of the the group of people that like the herd you know people that all think the same that go along to get along that just let's just say they don't do a lot of self reflection or a lot of deep discernment they want the society the group or the collective to tell them what to do who they are what their life should be like, what they should value, what they should like, what they shouldn't like. Now, when you talk about the collective, you don't really talk about it like that. You know, it's hard for me to explain, but I was kind of hoping you would kind of explain how how the individual's pursuit of their purpose, finding their purpose in life and and, you know, grinding it out, how that balances out with... The, the society that they live in, the group at large. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. And I do share your sentiments on the collective as well. And that's something I battled with my whole life. And, and through thinking about that and saying, I don't understand, how could this be? You know, we have to deal with, you have to deal with the collective every day and the systems created by groupthink and because I I've struggled with it so many years, I said there has to be another way, and that's when I started to think about that. But I I do too look at the collective as almost like a safe space, and it is the that herd mentality, and in the herd that's where safety is, and you know you're less vulnerable in a group, and we all know how uh, risky it could be to go outside of the herd and you know whether you're talking about public speaking and you separate it and you're worried about you know being judged by the the herd and that's why so many people are afraid to public speak but so I something I thought about my whole life and I felt like it was always me against the system and we could call the collective many things you can call it the a herd you can call it a system it's just everyone else, however you want to look at it. But that said, we can't escape it. We can't escape it. And there must be some reason that we have to deal with it. And I know the puzzle analogy that so many great teachers have used over the years, you know, that we're all part of a puzzle. I just had to look at that more closely and say, well, that that is interesting how uh, we can take individually We'll, we always want to break things apart and then work to put them back together and uh, or to dis- rediscover something 
ourselves and that makes you wonder about this whole you know did our creator you know i think in my head and i've heard this from someone i don't you know maybe it was alan watts or someone who gave it talked about it like maybe god you know broke himself up into all these little pieces and we have to figure out a way to come back together so i've been thinking about it like that and that's what that talk was on on the um, our greater purpose and i often think well there has to be something more to life than just our own individual pursuits you know that's my job i'm a plumber i'm a doctor i'm an artist i do this or that and uh you know so many things people do they, what if they go, even if they go obsolete, your trade or your some thing you did, well, then you say, well, how does that affect eternity? What was the whole purpose? And it makes you realize that whatever we're doing individually as a pursuit in terms of a job or a hobby is insignificant in the bigger picture. And I said, everybody individually has things they want to do and express themselves and have creativity. And that's a beautiful thing. And every single person is different and, and they all have a different purpose on that level. So it must be on the collective side, we have a common purpose. That's the way I'm thinking of it. Because if you start to think about the duality of life, that's everywhere. I'm saying, well, if we individually have all this opportunity to do these different things and be creative in very different and unique ways, on the collective side, do we have some greater common purpose? I've thought about that my whole life, and then I start to think, okay, when we go through our day-to-day life, what makes us feel good or makes us feel bad? And... I realize that the things that make you feel good forever are good deeds, doing nice things for someone Mm. and being kind and generous and, and compassionate, et cetera. But yet if you, if you treat somebody poorly, which we all do, I mean, you know, we all have those days, you never feel good about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And conversely, you'll never really feel bad in the long run, taking the high road, at least I don't. So that started to point me into that direction of what is our common purpose as, as humans here. And I'm starting to realize that we have to, and, and all these teachings that all the great teachers over the years have talked about, we know about it, but we're not necessarily worried about doing it every day. You know, it's like we know we should be kind and generous and charitable, but we're not necessarily doing it the way you would perform your duty at work. So when you learn your skill at work or you're a professional and whatever you learn, you then have to do that every day and carry out those duties and like think about an athlete. They train, they train, they train, they learn, and then they perform. So we know what we need to do, but we're not necessarily doing it. So that to me is something where when the offering came into my life, the way it is assembled in this uh, crossword, and as you actually say, it's encoded. There's a code in here. I said, well, here it is. Here it is. Uh, Now I just need to, this is the map. Now I just need to go in this direction and try to do this, you know, and try to actually live up to it. So, yep. You know, I, that makes me think, you know, also in that, in the last one you posted where you are talking about the collective value of a society, of a group, you also use the word noble and it's, it's like you're pointing towards what a group of people any people collectively value as their most noble values, as their highest values that will perpetuate that good feeling 
that you're talking about in each people, in each person in the group. So it, what kind of strikes me, it's interesting that you and I both believe in something greater than ourselves. Like we both believe in God or spirit or the creator or whatever you want to name it. But I wonder if, so how would this apply to a collective that does not have a noble value or, or let's just say what I would call, or you would call a noble value. Like what would, a, <laughs> this is a tough question. What would a, a collective of atheists hold as a high value? Do we have any idea what that group would look like or what it would do? And I, I think I know the answer, but I wanted to see. An atheist may feel, is that what the, the question was or? Yeah, they I would have... say, I would say how, how does an atheist uh, perpetuate that good feeling that lasts a long time? Do they still value generosity, kindness, you know, charity, if they don't have, if, if the group that they're in doesn't promote a noble value as, as a high value? Yeah, does that make that's sense? A, yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and I always look at, well, as we are here in the physical, this is the complete opposite of, of, of God or our creator. You know, we can't even really conceptualize something without a beginning and an end and eternity really to its fullest. We, we talk about it, but we really don't truly understand it. But we, what we do understand is, is the term limits on life here on earth. And whatever right. we're doing is, is it, is short lived. It's not not going to go on into eternity if you didn't believe in God. So if you are an atheist or someone that doesn't have a belief in life after death, then what would be the point? You would it, you, there would be no reason to have a value in that. You could be dead tomorrow. So does that mean all your good deeds die with you tomorrow or anything you did? To make the world a better place so i don't see how you know think of it like an ice cream cone you know it's gonna melt and you want to gobble it all up right away but after it's gone you're not thinking about it, it doesn't mean anything to you you may you probably feel bad <laughs> afterwards you probably feel yeah. bad after you ate it it's like why did i do that yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah you know we are melting as as humans i mean so i personally can't wrap my mind around not believing in something and it almost doesn't make sense to me because look you know we came from somewhere and we're you know something's happening so i don't see how you can value really much of anything when you because you're only feeding you're only feeding the the flesh and the mind the ego that serves the flesh i mean we all we all need an ego and my th whole thing is we want our, I want my ego to serve, yes, the flesh, and I want to be able to be creative and ex express myself in a noble manner, but I also want to serve eternity and serve, you know, the greater, my soul or my spirit. But if, if I wasn't, if my ego is only serving my flesh, well, then I wouldn't even be looking at some of these words because most of these words actually that we talk about go beyond the flesh. Compassion. Yeah. Compassion is something, well, that's something that's really not going to... So I don't see how it's really true and authentic how you can embrace those noble concepts and not have a deeper belief. And that was a long answer. I'm sorry, but I had to think it well, through. That's, that's a, no, that's, a, it's a, that, that's totally fine. We're here to, we're here to like, you know... Wood, Sometimes wood you... you and yeah. And you ask a great question and it's like, wow, I got to think that through and make that. But that's how I'm thinking about it. And well, it's a tough question. Like, it's a tough question for me. I've thought about it. And when I asked it to you, I'm still thinking about it. You know, I have my idea like, oh, I think I think I know the answer. But what's it's your answer? Really, it's, I, th I well, I'll actually I'll answer it like this. I'll use another thing that you said in in your video on purpose to try to point out what I think the answer is. You said that these acts of like living your life, go like go, go out and engage with the world and the acts of like, let's say be kind 
be generous, uh, be, be compassionate, for example. You said those things are much more difficult to practice and to live by than to be hateful or, or to hate or to condemn or to criticize. And I, I, I know that to be true. I don't question that at all. It is much easier for me to be, to just, you know, condemn something or someone and go, oh, that, that's crap. That's, that's, you know, that person's terrible for whatever reason. Oh, he or she is just to condemn them. It's much harder to go, okay, they make mistakes just like me, but underneath what I'm seeing when I meet someone or interact with someone, there's something there that's that's bigger and better and more powerful. Like there's probably love inside that person. There's beauty inside that person. There's creativity. There's compassion. There's kindness. And it's like, you don't always get to see those things when you interact with the world. But what you're saying is you have to be those things to see those things. You have to practice those things. And then all of a sudden, when you start practicing them, you start to become aware of them in, in the, in the world at large, in all of your interactions with, maybe it's even with animals, you know, interactions with, with nature, with the planet, with other beings, you'll start to, if you practice those things, you'll start to see those things. So to try to answer your question, you know, and it's going to be interesting if any atheists happen to listen to this podcast. Um, and I've had plenty of conversations with devout atheists and we, we, I typically think that they end up in a cul-de-sac. They, they never really have a legitimate answer for their position, in my opinion. So what I, what I think is the, the atheist is someone who's in self-denial and they are just, they're actually practicing instead of practicing being kind, generous, loving, you know, compassionate, they're they're not necessarily practicing hate or condemnation. They're kind of just opting out of the whole process. They're like, I would kind of say, let's say morally or intellectually or spiritually lazy. And so they're like, well, I can't prove God. So therefore, I'm not going to even consider it. I'm just going to go about my life and take what comes day by day, you know, and, but the people that I know that are atheists with the exception of one, I have one friend who's an atheist that actually does have a very like uplifting disposition, but most of the ones I've actually met and talked to and gotten to know, you know, what I sense in them is a level of confusion that leads to denial, some sort of self-denial. And so they, they don't tend to invest in these hard things like practicing compassion it's hard it's difficult practicing kindness is very hard especially when someone is unkind to you it's very hard to practice kindness when someone is hateful or attacking you it's super hard to not be triggered by that and practice something greater it's very hard so you said that in in that talk on purpose that, uh, you know, criticizing, being hateful is easy, but loving and caring and compassion is harder. And since it's harder, it has, it's, it has more reward. It's a, there's a greater, like you said, there's a, a greater, how do you perpetuate that happy? I don't want to say happy. How do you perpetuate that good feeling when you do an action? Well, if you do a critical action, you're not going to feel good about it. If you do a loving action, like you said, you're going to feel good about it for a long, long time, maybe eternally, like you're talking about. So ho hopefully that answers that. Yeah. And and one more thing on the, um, and, and these are just conversations. I'm not, you know, making any judgments or saying anything is absolute. I just, things that go through my mind, I ask questions to myself in terms of, well, if I didn't believe in God or something greater, I, you know, we can't reduce it to a word anyway. God, you know, we can't, the creator, if I, uh, if I didn't 
have faith in my creator and a, and a higher power. Well, is that, I'm not loving myself enough to think I'm part of that. So if there's this grand creator, the God that created all of us, and there's a piece of God in all of us and all the animals. And, and if he created everything, that means he's in everything in one form or another. I honor that, that there's a piece of God in me, you know? Mm -hmm. And if I don't believe in that, then I'm just reduced down to a piece of flesh. And so, it, you know, it doesn't even, for me, I can't make sense of it, but I choose to honor this whole process and honor is a word in the offering and love is a yep. word in the offering. But, uh, I honor this, this, uh, life and the life force that's in me. And I also honor the challenge or well, not even a challenge, but the opportunity to grow and to learn and to, to reclaim my power and use my choice to make the world a better place. And to me, that's a fascinating concept that it really ultimately it's, it's, if I, if you were a baker and I gave you all the ingredients for life and I gave it to you and I said, you bake what you want, you bake what you want, you know, and you make the best of it. Well, yeah. So, you know, the, let, I was just thinking when listening to that, I was like, we should break down the word honor because it's a short one and I could probably do it off the top of my head. Please do. Yeah. And, you know, because it's, again, for those that haven't really looked at the offering yet, go to Michael's website, brandofferings.com, look at the offering and engage with it and read the story. Go in there and, and read how the offering came about or listen to our last podcast because we break down the meanings of these words and they're we've all agreed upon the words that we use, but we don't always know what the meanings of the words we're using are. We get lost in the symbols and we forget what the symbols, you know, originally meant. And then over time, those symbols change because they get, they get nuanced by the, the times. So honor is such a beautiful and powerful word. One, it's very, it's a balanced word. You know, it's, it's got that two syllable on, or it's like a very balanced sound to me. It's a, a, a masculine sound, but the, let's say the letter H and its structure, what it essentially means. And these are just general meanings. It's a, it's a, for me to go in and explain how every single letter came to be what it is, is like, it would take, you know, thousands, <laughs> thousands of hours, but to simplify it. The letter H has this breath sound. It's this, you know, this, this expelling this, huh, you know, this, it's a sigh sort of, or, a, a well, what it means is a pulse an expulsion an expression. And that's why our words with H tend to have that like, huh, or huh, or ho, or huh sound. So that's what H does is it's, it's an outward expression. And then the letter O has a lot of meanings, but it's, it's in simple terms, it's a ring, it's a circle. And the circle is this very sacred symbol, this sacred, because it basically means the center of everything or what the universe is. It's a never ending curve that connects to itself forever, perpetually. And so the letter O refers to like being being in the center, it refers to revealing what's inside and bringing it forth to reveal the inside. And it also um, means home because when you're centered, you're, you feel at home. And so you have H O and then N N is a wave. The letter N is like a Z turned on its side and it's just a zigzagging wave, but N is the ending of a wave, whereas the letter M is the same type of symbol, but M has that other leg on it, and that that promotes the idea that the wave is not ending, it's, it's continuing. So N is the ending of a wave, 
And then O again, we're back to the center or or home. And then R. R is is a, a very interesting one. R is one of those letters that's a liquid, what they call a liquid, because it has this vibrating sound that sh that can be perpetuated, like like it's it's going to keep going, ra, you know, like ra. It just keeps going. And L is another liquid as well. And M and N are also liquids, but R and L are the the most common and most powerful liquids, and they're also in a ton of words. And they represent like right and left, you know, left and right. So anyway, R actually represents this movement forward, this this power or an energy that moves. And it refers to to king, to being like a king, kingly, like Ra, the sun. Um, Ra, Re, Ro, Ru, Rai, those all mean the same thing. Uh, they all mean like the king or kingly or supreme or that's where we get the word royal you know roy rob ro ru ra the sun they all mean that so let's see honor if you put all that together honor is going to be this this breath like expulsion expression or exp expulsion of being centered and then in a way i guess in a waveform because you have that in in the middle which stops that expression, but then it starts again. You go back to O and you're back in the center and you you go to R, which is like a supreme or a kingly part of that center. So it's hard to explain the etymology of these words, but you can do it in the sounds, like the actual sounds like there's etymology breakdowns of sounds and there's also etymology breakdowns of each letter and there's also breakdowns of the way those letters fit together with other letters because there's context for symbols that are placed next to each other and that, that context context links ideas together and links ideas together in such a way that we have a, a bigger concept a word you know and a word can be, we can go on and on and on about words. There's so many different layers to just one simple word. Like ask, you know, the age old question, well, what does the word love mean? It's like, we all know what love means, but then again, we don't, we can't talk about it. Like we just don't understand how to talk about it, but we all know how to use it. We kind of know what it is. Words are like that. They kind of have this, like this uh, magical power that they have in our reality. They dictate and uphold our reality uh, to a great degree. But we, okay, so yeah, so that's kind of a long-winded answer, but I, that's kind of the power of honor is wrapped up in the letters themselves, in the word itself, in the idea itself, in the concept itself. Yeah, and that is so fascinating. And I like that, the, the H with the outward expression that is, uh, I, you know, you never think of those things really how you, when you break it down, you would never just logically say, oh yeah, that's what these words, these letters mean. So it's truly uh, fascinating when you break it down and, ex and explain it the way you do. And if I, if I may comment on the word love, it, it was the first word in the offering that started oh, yeah. the whole, the whole thing. But you know, that was a word that I too grappled with. Like, what does, what is love? What does it mean? And this is my opinion only, of course, but I said, well, could it be that love, which was the first word is all of the words in the offering? Because if you could live this in any given day in this frame of mind or this energy field, I mean, that would be, I, I, first of all, I've never been able to, I mean, it's a nice map and I, I use it as a guide, but, uh, you know, I'm not able to live like this. So I wonder to myself, could love be these 53 words all lived out in, in harmony by not only the individual, but then by extension, it would be 
if everybody lived it individually, you would have a full unification of the collective. You would return back home to God collectively and individually. Like that's, that's my mind. You know, I'm not saying mm -hmm. that's what it is, but that's what the way I've been looking at it. Uh huh. And, and, uh, you know, that's just my thought. That's a, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the word itself, like the sound, the tone is very, very much similar to like, it's a, it's an all encompassing kind of sound a lot like ohm you know like love is very similar to ohm it's got that home in it it's got that i i don't know how to say it other than like this o this like o sound and o means home it means the center of yourself it means revealing what's inside it means home and so it has that love has that kind of sound and you know i did a podcast a long time ago with a friend of mine, Claire Andrews, she was and still is all about love. That's her thing. She's always trying to express and find, she's try, always trying to find the opportunity to express love in all different kinds of ways. You know, it doesn't have to, you know, just a gesture or, you know, or sometimes loving someone can be tough, you know, like tough love where you're, you're just holding your ground in silence, you know, that can be loving. I'd have to go, I should go back and revisit that podcast because she talked a lot about what love means to her. And uh, the podcast was called, I think it was called The Love Revolution with Claire Andrews. But it's a lot like God, right? You and I, we've, we kind of already talked about this, but we can say, we can use the word God and you and I know what we're talking about. And so does everyone else when they hear that word. But yet we we still don't know what God is. No no one really does. Or or let's say if someone does know what God is, there's no way for them to speak it. There's no way for them to describe it. You know, words really just won't do it. They won't do it justice. And that's another interesting thing about language is that not only does language uphold our reality and build it and, and create our mindset and create our beliefs and color the world the way we see it, it's so powerful that it does that, yet it's still lacking. It still falls short. You know, words will never be able to describe everything. It won't. It won't be able to describe the universe. There's always going to be what the Toltecs call the, uh, the unknowable, you know, and wh whoever the creator or, or the great spirit or God set it up that way to where humans are going to always be unable <laughs> to know everything. Maybe it's a way to keep us humble, you know, that we can't know everything. Yeah. And that, is something I too have thought about and I like to I'll share you know my idea on that you know when we're when we're young children we come in and we're just learning information we're just taking everything in real time and we're we get old enough where we go into grade school you go into first grade and second grade and third grade you you're given a curriculum that you want to learn. And we all say, I do believe here, the ego, the humans, the, us and we here, as we are here in the flesh, we do mirror the universe and God is in ways that we can. So for example, we have foundational teachings. We, we say, well, we all should read and write and learn English and learn arithmetic and these basic things, right? So we all have a foundation of education that we hope minimally that these kids acquire before they reach adulthood and then they mm -hmm. could go on to their own life. So um, what I find interesting is that we go into second grade, you have to learn that, but a young child isn't questioning, you know, if a young child in second grade said, I want to know what they're learning in college, the teacher might say, well, look, that's great, but you need to learn this first. Mm -hmm. You need to learn this. You you know you you have to learn 
to read and write and grammar and all this first, and then you'll be able to, to go there. But it's this progression, just like in music, you have to learn your scales. And, but a child for the most part, just takes what they're, what they're given and they're going to learn it. They're tested on it and then they'll go up a level. So I think of, uh, well, this goes back to purpose. We, our life, we have a curriculum here as in the flesh as humans individually. And I believe the curriculum in my, this is my just belief, but it's, it's to live the words in the offering, you know, to, to, to be this, you know, to be kind and gentle, all these words, kind and generous and use your imagination and joy and love and peace and cooperation and loyalty and grace and awareness. So, so imagine learning all of this, but never really testing out never taking that test out so you can go to that next grade. And I feel mm -hmm. like we, we know these things, but we're not necessarily doing it all the time. And that's fine. You know, just like if you're playing the scales on a guitar, you know, you're not going to get it perfect, but as soon as you mess it up, you're all right, I got to start all over again. So mm -hmm. that's how I'm thinking about it, that this is our curriculum to learn here. And as humans, we're in, I think we can't know everything anyway. We could never know everything. And uh, like I even think, oh, they're sending, Elon Musk is sending things and he's putting, dropping stuff on planet Mars and we're looking with microscopes and we're, we're trying, or telescopes and we're trying to find all this thing. And I'm like, well, look, all the beauty and power and real knowledge is within us. I mean, we don't need to go pollute another planet yet. Why don't we just figure, figure everything out here first? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, then, you know, I'm thinking this in my head, like we're just going away from the power within us when we're trying to send things far away. And ultimately we're going to come back to, no, you have to, you have to live and do these things that are in the offering before yep. you can test out. So I, that's kind of something I was thinking about The you know, it's interesting, the word foundation, because you talk in the, in the last one about purpose, you talk about finding a clear understanding of what your purpose is. And you, you basically say some people don't know what, even what that means or where to begin. And you say, well, just beginning on that process could be your foundational purpose. And the word found foundational, you know, obviously the root of that is found. Like you find something you, when I hear the word found, it to me, it kind of just means to discover. Like, I don't think you're going to find anything that hasn't been found already before by, by other beings, by other humans, but you're going to find it or discover it for yourself. And like you're saying, when you test out, uh, when you learn something and it becomes your foundation, the only way that it can be your foundation is if you've actually discovered it and you, you, now you know it because now you can kind of, you can take it with you. You can build on it. And so it's just interesting that we, you know, I'm just thinking about that word, like, well, what is our foundational purpose? Or another way to say this, what would a collective or a group, a society's foundational value be? And of course, that's it. Go ahead. Continue. No, no, you continue, please. Well, it's just this idea that that you, man, it's it's weird. Words are like words are limiting, but that you find it that there's something inside of each person that if they intend to, they can discover something, and then they can they can basically own it. They could they, it becomes a part of them. They're like, and they can take it with them. For, from that moment on, they can take it with them until they die. And that becomes their foundation. And so purpose and foundation are obviously like deeply related because you, you speak about that. Finding a clear understanding of what one's purpose is. And it seems to me that anybody who's honest with themselves wants this. You know, I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what your job is. I don't care what your, how much fame you have or how you appear to be. You still deep down inside 
we all want to have this feeling or that uh, it's not even a feeling. We want to have this knowing that we are here to do something important and important doesn't, doesn't mean important in the eyes of the group, important in the eyes of the collective. It's just important to you individually. Mm -hmm. It's so common that we all want this. So we all are trying to, we're all trying to find our foundation. <laughs> we're trying and, and to found it, you know, like the founding fathers. It's like, we're trying to, we're trying to build something. And that building has to do with discovering or finding something. You know, Ryan, that's why I love, you know, having these conversations with you because I'll never hear that word again and think of it the same way because of the way you just broke it down. I never thought about, I never thought to say, break the word up and say found <laughs> as simple as and obvious as it is, but it's, it's, it's hidden in plain sight, obviously. But, uh, when you break it down the way you do it, it just gets you thinking further. And yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the point, you know, it's like, I, I'm not, I don't pretend to know everything about all these words and what they mean. I have an understanding. Let's say I have a foundation. <laughs> I have found a foundation of etymology because I've studied enough of it to go, okay, there's some really interesting stuff here. Um, but I don't pretend to know all there is to know about it. Um, and it's, I don't know. I think that when you're talking about the offering, it's almost, you almost, if you spend time with the offering and use it, you're going to go through this process just, just, uh, you know, indirectly, you're just going to have a different understanding of what each word means when each one of those words, if used in the offering correctly with like something you have going on in your life, once you see the, the, the resonance and the energy that happens when you use the offering and let's say a certain word, uh, becomes a part of you and then changes you, you're not going to see that word the same anymore. It's going to have a deeper meaning and, and not only yeah deeper, but just, it's going to have a greater meaning. Yes. And, and I learned something from you. Uh, well, that's how I found you. I, I, the offering was gifted to me and then I started to discover certain treasures within it. And I, I and then I found you because I was saying, I, I was fascinated with words because I, most of my life I was getting, uh, taken advantage of by words, you know, in the, whether it be the legal system or, you mm. know, you take like the IRS code, you think any one of the words in the, uh, the thousands upon thousands of words and pages, any one of those words is going to serve you <laughs> and your personal, <laughs> you know, think about it, your, your insurance policy, you know, you read the, and you say all these words. So I started to dig in and then I found you and we started to have conversations. I listened to all your videos. And then when you started to talk about the etymology, and I'm going to tell you a discovery I, I come upon because of you. And, and you started to break down. And then you talked about how you know, maybe they used the sun and, and branches or instruments to look at shadows. And then they created these symbols all in an effort to communicate with God. And I'm assuming that, you know, to be, you know, uh, to understand more and to communicate back. And you talk about, I can't speak to it as eloquently as you can, but I'm just giving you a rough idea how they use symbols and, and how we come to the place we are. But I realized something from there. And what I realized is that the spoken word serves the universe it goes out into the universe into eternity so that's why it's very important to watch how you speak and what you say because that's going out that's mm -hmm. that's connecting to a vibrational frequency that's that's resonating around the universe but the ego and the flesh and the the dark side of humans what do they do with words they put it in writing well, they've, they've used it. They, they've manipulated it. I know in, in the old days, people would maybe scratch it into a wall to 
to teach and, and to, you can talk more on this when I'm done and, and to, but humans through their ego and, and, uh, the, their dark side, if you will, use these words to control people and they put it, those words in writing yeah. and, and, and anything in the flesh we know doesn't last and doesn't go on. You know, there'll be a day when the IRS code or, uh, you know, these insurance, but all that, they'll mean nothing. You, they won't even be around. Yep. But your actions will be. They'll be recorded for all time and, in, in, you know, into eternity. The, the, your, your good actions and your noble actions and when you find your purpose. So I stumbled upon that through talking with you and listening to, you, to your podcast because I just, I became fascinated with the words. And then I said, well, there's more to it. And then I, you break into that. You dig into that deeply. But it gets you thinking. And you realize that the words are the bridge to our creator. Yep. Vibrationally. Through that yeah. vibration. Yeah, they it, it they are. It's, it's interesting. And <laughs> you're so right about legal jargon and and contracts and you know it's obviously set up for a specific type of control and manipulation and we 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 agree with it we sign the contracts and we we do it but that reminds me well two things you said there one thing i want to say that you you said multiple times is that your mind is private property there's a there's a no trespassing sign at least on your mind you know and and I agree I'm the same way there is a certain place where within each person in their being that no that no other being can go no one can see the world through your eyes no one can be inside you and so the the creator has given us this as a gift it's like what goes on inside you is private property it's good to just I'm just reiterating what you said because it's good to just remember that, that we're being bombarded all the time in our current times with all these words, all these messages, all these symbols and even sigils. And to the untrained eye, which is 99% of us, because not many people study symbology. I study it a little bit. I could study more, but even from what little I know, I realize that like 90, I'm just saying 90, whatever, 98, 99% of us don't, we're not, we're completely unaware of the dark forces that are being messaged to us on a regular basis. You know, it requires our consent because our mind is private property, but we consent, we allow those, we, we click Yes, continue. I will engage, you know, I'll open up this app, I'll watch this movie, I'll you know, go down this this uh this journey here and we consent to allowing these symbols and sigils in, into our lives. And it's tough. It's it's something that that's why we're talking about this. Your work with the offering is the opposite. It's using the same thing, it's using words and symbols in a, a a square grid a code but it's using it in a positive way in in a good way in, in as a way to let's say take back your mind a way to un, undo maybe some of the consensual symbols that we have allowed ourselves to you know be washed over us over the years so i just wanted to say that and then um before I forget, this is a really interesting point. It's going to it's going to be a whole like another segue here, but it's just interesting and hopefully people listening will take the time to look at this. When it comes to using the word to speaking the word to communicate with the universe, to communicate with God, I completely agree with you that that's that's how that's how and why our language came to be symbols, abstracted and and came to be what they are that we use. However, there's another approach that I don't think I've shared with you from, and it's in the Hebrew world. However, I don't think it originated in the Hebrew world, but the Hebrews somehow claimed it. That they created, they say that they created 
the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet with, let's see, how do I explain this? There's a great guy named Stan Tenen. You can find his videos on YouTube. Stan, and his last name is T-E-N-N-E-N or A-N, Stan Tenen. Anyway, I'll see if I can explain this in simple terms. He postulates, and it is very convincing too, the way he does it, that the the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet came came into being with the use of an apple. So the people that created this, whoever they were, wanted to hide the foundation. There we go again, the foundation of the way the, the, the their language came to be. And they hid it in a dance or they hid it in the movement of their own body so that they would never forget it. So that if, if exactly what you were talking about, if the letters fell into the wrong hands and the wrong hands took those letters and they used the letters and words to for dark forces to manipulate and control that the people that created the letters in the to begin with would never fall for that trick because they knew the foundation of how the letters actually came to be but it's not something that they ever wrote down it's something that they encapsulated in their body as a dance and it's fascinating if I can, I'll try, I'm trying to explain it, but imagine you have an apple in your hand, okay? And you're looking at it. The apple was a symbol of life because it came off a tree and you could, you could find it in the wilderness and you could eat it and survive. And that's why the apple is in all these very ancient stories, you know, uh, like the Garden of Eden and all that. It's a symbol of life. So imagine you're holding an apple in your hand and the part that your hand is covering up you kept that part but you cut away the part that you can see and so your thumb and your your let's say your palm and your four fingers kind of wrap around the back and the front of the apple and you cut everything away that you that you're looking at but you leave the core so it's again very hard to explain but you're if you do this you're left with a shape that starts with your thumb goes through the palm of your hand and up the other sides of your fingers and this whole thing goes right up the middle uh, what the core would be and it actually spirals because the apple is a circle it's a sphere every every single surface of it is curved from from the the, the north pole of the apple to the south pole of the apple it's a toroidal field uh, the apple is like the perfect, you know, toroid, which they thought was what the shape of the universe was, which it's ironically a lot of modern day physicists talk about the donut theory, which is just two toroidal, two toroidal sphere, uh, you know, a north toroid and a south toroid put together, constantly moving in and out of each other, just like magnetism does. So these ancient peoples might have been might have been way ahead on this so anyway i know you won't be able to actually visualize this shape but what they did was they actually made this shape out of they probably carved it out of wood uh, eventually it got made into metal when we when metallurgy came around and it's this it's this shape that you put in the palm of both your hands it actually wraps around your thumb and this is where the idea of the serpent in the garden comes from for these people. It's like the tail of a serpent. It wraps around your thumb. It goes across, you know, underneath your palm. It spirals up what the core of the apple would be. And it goes up your four fingers and kind of wraps around. And you hold these things in your hand. And so there are all these different positions. Like if you hold your palms towards yourself, let's say right at eye level, uh, that shape has a specific shape. But if you were to turn your palms sideways and, you know, put them down at your waist and then looked at the, the these shapes, they would have a totally different, it would look totally different. And then if you took these shapes and you um, put them behind your back facing upward, you, you can't see them, but imagine that you could, what shape would they make? And so... 
what these people did was they made 22 different movements with their body. And each one of these movements from where their eye level is, looking at the, the shape in the palm of their hands, would, would be a letter. And when you see Stan Tenen do this, like he actually has these things in his hands. When you see him do it, you'll understand it makes a lot of sense. He's like, oh, that looks like, you know, Resh, the letter Resh in Hebrew. Oh, that looks like Aleph, the letter, you know, I think that's the first letter. And then there's, you know, I forget, I don't know all the Hebrew letters, you know, uh, what they're all called, Lambda. You know, that looks like this and that. So there's 22 different phases in this dance that these people do would do with their body. And to the untrained eye, it would just be like a cultural dance. But to the creators of this system, you could call them shamans or priests or, you know, magicians, magi, to those people, they didn't even need to have these things in their hands anymore. They knew this is all in their mind now. This is all in their mind's eye. They could go dance around with each other and talk to each other. And they, could, they knew what all these words and these gestures would mean. And so, so take it a step further. Let's say you wanted to communicate with someone with these letters. All you would have to do, if you wanted a general, like a basic idea to come across, you could just move your hands in a couple different ways. And it would look like you're just, you're just, you know, animately talking. Like say, a passionate European talks with their hands, right? And they go, ah, ah, they throw their hands around when they talk. Well, these people would know a much deeper meaning to what their body was doing when they were talking to each other. And they would have, they would be able to kind of talk in secret. I know that's a very long, long winded example, but for anyone who's listening, it's worth the time to read Stan Tenen's books or to at least look him up on YouTube and look at his idea of where the Hebrew alphabet came from. It's very fascinating, but it also speaks to that letters are not just these dead symbols on a page. They have a tremendous amount of meaning. They have a tremendous amount of power. They have multiple levels of meaning for different people, for different reasons, in different times, at different perspectives. Yeah, that is that is fascinating. And that, uh, that word foundation comes to mind because they found that... <laughs> That, that symbolism in the dance and that's the foundation of there but you're right it, in the words and the letters and the symbols and you know something I, I don't quote me exactly on this but if you take the power of words and how how they can work for you or against you the IRS code has something like 10 million words I, I was something I, I noticed, you know, maybe it's more or less, but the uh, Declaration of Independence is like 1,320 words. The Bill mm -hmm. of Rights is like 462, and the Ten Commandments is 297. And then when you look at some of these bills they're passing with, you know, in Washington, D.C., and they're, you know, thousands uh -huh. upon thousands of pages, 6,000 pages. And you say those words are not working for people, mm -mm. but they're using them. So knowing that, that the words that we use and the symbols behind them and the, and the going to work for you or against you. So it's in everybody's best interest to understand it. And it's, uh, I find it fascinating. I really do. And most of my life I've been abused by words, you know, been taken advantage of by not understanding. You know, you go to court and you hear all these words. It's like, why am I paying these fines? All I was doing was, you know, uh, 60 miles an hour over the speed limit. And they're <laughs> just, just joking. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But, uh, you know, so, but it's really interesting, Ryan, how you break all that down. It, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm the same with you. I think I've been abused by words and for most of my life too. Somewhere along the line, someone was telling me about the word understanding. Understanding is to stand under. So the way that I was told was, even though I use that word all the time, it's sort of a pejorative. It's like, if you have understanding, then somebody else is standing over you. 
you you mm. are un, you are understanding you know you are being stood you're standing under someone else or something I never th- I never thought about it that way yeah well me neither I can't remember where I got this I mean this is kind of common it's probably out out there all over the internet. yeah and and then there's and then the other word that goes with that was substance so I think it was like so substance is to to stand on something you know because your stance you're substanding so if I think that's correct don't don't quote me on that but anyway you just made me think about that with that with being abused by words yeah me too and so that's why it's uh, it's great to point people back to the offering because there's not that many things out there that are trying to to teach people how to use words in a positive way you know how to use how to use words and and not be controlled by them you know how to use words that in, in an empowering way that's what's so beautiful about your work and the offering is it's simple but it's very effective as well it's a cheat sheet and i'll just add this to the as the offering if people are new to, to this but the idea with the, them being locked in into this grid uh is that you want to they have to remain together so for example creativity is a word well if you're going to create anything in life make sure it doesn't conflict with any of the other words so you want to create things that are are, are going to um, promote kindness and harmony and and you know love and joy and peace and and the same with you know any any of these words you're going to teach you want to teach something and you want to learn, these are both words, you want to learn as long as you're not violating any of the other words. So if you're learning something about being fearful, well, you're already in violation of the word fearless is on the left side, upper yep. left corner. So if you're learning to be fearful, well, that's no good. And, you know, you want to be tolerant, but you don't want to give up your freedom. You see? Yep. So... You know, a lot of people talk about tolerance. Well, that doesn't mean I'm going to let you walk all over me and abuse me. But I'm, I'm, uh, you can be tolerant of yourself. You can be, to- that's a that's a whole nother talk. I won't get into it all now, but you know, you don't want to give up something because then the word is being hijacked. You know, yep. th- because it's easy to extrapolate one word and abuse it. So what I like about the offerings, it keeps them together and it's, uh, you got a better chance of not, you know, this, in a way, these words create a herd or a collective consciousness in a, in its own way, but for a good cause, yep. they must all remain together to protect each other, yep. but for a good and noble purpose. So, and that's why I like, you know, and I, now I can say I found this and it's the foundation and now that you explained it to me that way. So this came to me as a gift, by the way. So, so much I learned after hooking up with you, though. I got to tell you that I, I've, you know, something I knew there was a lot more. And in talking to you, it's been so helpful. Even you said to me right away the first time, it's a code. I never thought about it that way. You said it's yeah. encoded, isn't it? The wisdom is encoded in here. And that's your words. And now I use it all the time. But yeah, no, it I got is, it though. from you, but I got yeah. that from you. But I, now I say, Hey, the wisdom is encoded in here. It's a, all the teachings of, but I never thought of it as a code. I owe you for that. Ah, well, you're welcome. It's your gift that you've given to, to me and to others. So that's, that's my way of giving, <laughs> giving a little bit back, but you know, it's great that, that the offering is 53 words instead of 6,000. Like, <laughs> like you're talking about. I mean, imagine, I mean, here's the thing. Look, look, we're, we're all, this is the modern world, right? We're all supposedly uh, hip, modern, smart, intelligent, technologically sound, new school humans, right? Well, mm. who on earth would think that it makes any kind of sense, any kind of logical sense, that if you want to pass a rule or a law or make a change in, in society that it's going to require 6,000 words to, to describe it, to make it happen. Like it's such a, 
a contradiction on its face. There should be no laws in, ex in human existence that are more than a few words. You know, thou shall not do this. Thou shalt do that. It's like, it's just painful to think that a 6,000 word document has any meaning whatsoever to the common man. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense. And I actually use the offering to find my truth on when I get things like that come up and I say, well, how do I feel? And I'll look at the words and I say, well, first of all, what's their intention? And that's a word up. And, and, and I say, well, 6,000 words, their intention is not good. And then it, I'm fearful. <laughs> it, it, all, it already makes me, you know, fear. And I, okay. And, and for some reason, these 6,000 words are taking away my freedom. See, so that's in violation yep. right here. Yep. It's taking away any kind of wealth you have, you know, and I'm not talking about yachts and boats. I'm just talking about prosperity. You know, we all want to work and prosperity is a word in here. On, it's a vertical yep. word on the right side. So, you know, in these 6,000 page things, are they, you know, what are they doing? So I look at, I use the offering every day to find uh, the truth in things. And then I say, okay, well, I have to surrender myself, but, but I, if I have to surrender freedom, that's no good. I want to surrender to God. I'm not surrendering to my government. <laughs> and so I, no. that's how I, and I don't want to go down another rabbit hole, but that's how I use this for my own, you know, balance and truth. So. Yep. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. I think that's a good place for us to probably stop it right now. Yeah. We're a little over, a little over an hour and. There's definitely like some meaty stuff, meaty concepts for the listeners to get into there. So unless you have anything, you know, anything else you want to add or. No, um, I, I, th I think. No, I just want to thank you, Ryan, because I, I enjoy our conversations. No matter what we talk about, you provide so much depth of knowledge on any topic. And I, I'm fascinated by that. And that's why I, I listen to your your stuff over and over. I'll listen to it two or three times on your YouTube channel because I learn more every time I listen to it. So thank you well, for, th for that. Well, hey, thank you. I appreciate those kind words. Thank you very much. You know, I'm just glad that it reaches. I'm glad that it reached you. You know, I'm happy that if it reaches uh, other people and that they get something out of it, they don't even, I, I don't even care if they agree with me or if they get something totally different than even my intention. I just, you know, as long as it has some kind of value for the listener, then I feel like it's worth putting up. Then I did my job, you know, I put it up there and somebody got something out of it, something good out of it, something they can yeah. take away. Absolutely. So, well, hey, Mike, thank you so much for joining us again and um, exploring more of the offering. And I think that uh, it's worth exploring further and further and getting getting deeper into it. We didn't talk about too many words, but um, we definitely talked about a lot of big concepts. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Ryan. Maybe the next time. I appreciate it, and uh, you know, thank you again.